Hello and welcome to GI 101. My name is Dr. Adriana Lazarescu and I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. With me in the GI 101 studios today is my co-host for GI 101, Dr. Dan Sadowski. Dan, what are we going to talk about today? Well, I would like to discuss the diagnosis and classification of esophageal motility disorders. In particular, I would like to show how we use the technique of high-resolution esophageal manometry to make these diagnoses. I'm certainly fascinated by this topic, but is it really appropriate for all of our listeners? Well, in this episode, we are going to drill down into some fairly granular details about esophageal manometry. And this is probably more than what the average medical student needs to know. However, if you are a gastroenterology resident or a general or thoracic surgery resident, I think you will find this podcast useful. I should also mention that I will be showing a fair number of motility tracings and charts today. These may not display well on a small handheld device, and you may have better visibility using a tablet or even a laptop computer. Okay, let's get started. Right, so as you know, esophageal manometry has changed dramatically in the past 10 years. For example, we no longer use manometry catheters with four to five pressure sensors, producing pressure line tracings like the one shown here. Today, we have sophisticated and very sensitive esophageal pressure catheters that are capable of generating very exquisite details of esophageal motility. For example, in our lab, we use a pressure catheter like this, which has 36 sensors spaced at one centimeter intervals down its length. Each sensor detects pressure vectors in 12 different directions, providing information about pressure activity down the entire length of the esophagus. The data from the catheter is displayed on a topographical plot that looks somewhat like a weather map. This pressure plot is generated by commercial software. And in our case, we use ManoView in our lab, but there are other software packages out there by vendors such as Sandhill or MMS. All of these programs produce a similar variation on this theme. Pressure is now represented by color, with the more intense colors representing higher pressure. For example, an area of the plot that is red is of much higher pressure than an area of the plot that is blue. On this slide, you can see a red band of pressure at the top, which is the cricopharyngeus muscle. And you can also see periodic relaxations with the swallows with water that we asked the patient to do during the study. You can see another red pressure band at the bottom of the tracing, which is the esophagogastric junction. And you'll also see periodic relaxations with the solicited swallows. In the middle of the tracing, you will see the peristaltic pressure wave in the body of the esophagus. That's very interesting, Dan. How do we use this information to diagnose esophageal motility disorders? Right. So there are really two aspects to the analysis of an esophageal manometry tracing. First, we want to assess the EGJ, or the esophagogastric junction. Is the resting pressure high or low? Does the EGJ relax adequately to allow bolus passage with wet swallows? And is there a hiatus hernia? Secondly, we want to assess the esophageal body response to solicited wet swallows. Is peristalsis present or absent? Is the peristaltic amplitude high or low? And is there evidence for esophageal spasm? In this slide, we see the section of the tracing that assesses the esophageal gastric junction resting pressure. Traditionally, esophageal manometry has reported the resting lower esophageal sphincter pressure. We now know that there are many other factors that contribute to the barrier function of the esophageal gastric junction besides the lower esophageal sphincter, and so that's why the total EGJ resting pressure is now reported in modern manometry. In our lab, the normal EGJ resting pressure is between 10 and 45 millimeters of mercury. Here's an example in this slide of an EGJ resting pressure that is low, in this case, 5 millimeters of mercury. 
How do we make the diagnosis of a hiatus hernia on esophageal manometry? So remember that a hiatus hernia occurs when the lower esophageal sphincter, or LES, is no longer in close association with the diaphragm and is migrated more proximally into the thorax. This results in two distinct pressure bands, one from the LES and another from the crural diaphragm. In this tracing, you can see the upper greened pressure band indicating the level of the LES, and below, another pressure band seen intermittently on inspiration as the diaphragm exerts pressure on the hernia. This is a classic picture of hiatus hernia. You mentioned that the software does many of the pressure calculations for us. Can you explain what all of these software-generated numbers mean? Yes, there are three important metrics now used in esophageal manometry, and these are important concepts to grasp, as they will provide a better understanding of the current classification of esophageal motor disorders. These metrics are the integrated relaxation pressure, or IRP, the distal contractile integral, or DCI, and the distal latency. Let's begin with the IRP. The IRP is an assessment of EGJ relaxation with solicited wet swallows. It is a rather complex mathematical calculation that finds the lowest average pressure of four seconds duration immediately after a swallow. We used to simply measure the residual pressure of the EGJ after a wet swallow. How is the IRP better? The problem with simply measuring residual pressure is that it is influenced by the activity of the diaphragm. For example, if someone is breathing rapidly during the study, the increased diaphragmatic pressure exerted will falsely elevated the estimation of residual EGJ pressure. Fortunately, the ManaView software does this calculation for us. You can see on this slide that the software detects the timing of the UES relaxation with swallow, it's the first red arrow, and then it looks for the lowest pressures in the 10 second window immediately after the start of the swallow and does the calculation doing the integration over four seconds. In this case, the IRP comes out to 9.4, which is normal. In our lab, a normal IRP is less than 15 millimeters of mercury. While it's not essential to understand the mathematics of the IRP calculation, it is important to know that a high RP that is greater than 15 millimeters of mercury indicates that the EGJ is not relaxing appropriately with swallows, and this is a significant manometric finding. Let's talk about the distal contractile interval. What is the DCI? The DCI is an assessment of the total peristaltic pressure down the length of the esophageal body. And if you take one of our uh, topographical plots, which is a view from the top, and if you actually turn it slightly on its side so that you see the three axes, that is X, Y, and Z, as in this slide, you see the pressures of the esophagus looking like a mountain range. The DCI is simply an integration of all those pressures, basically calculating the volume of that mountain range. And so larger volumes indicate higher overall esophageal pressures. The DCI is then expressed as millimeters of mercury per second per centimeter, and normal values are between 450 and 8,000. The last metric to discuss is the distal latency. This number is an assessment of the presence of premature esophageal contractions. In other words, it's an assessment of whether esophageal spasm is present or not. Now, in order to understand distal latency, I need to introduce one more term which is the contractile deceleration point. This point, as you might expect from the name, is where the velocity of the peristaltic pressure wave begins to slow on the tracing as it approaches the EGJ. You can see from this point next to the red arrow on the tracing where the contractile front velocity slows, i.e. it slopes more to the left as it approaches the level of the EGJ. The importance of the contractile deceleration point is that it is a landmark used to calculate the distal latency. So here is the same manometry tracing with the analysis mode on. The distal latency is defined as the time in seconds from the onset of the swallow, see the vertical white line, 
to the contractile deceleration point. See the horizontal white line. In this case, the distal latency is 6.1 seconds. Any distal latency greater than 4.5 seconds is normal. Anything less than that indicates rapid progression of esophageal pressure waves, or spasm. Thanks, Dan, for that clarification. I think that we've covered a lot of ground for today, and perhaps we should continue with the rest next week. Well, if they can take my favorite book, The Hobbit, and make three movies out of it, I guess we can cover this topic in two episodes. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Bye.